Hi, I'm Shirley Liu from Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Harvard University. It is my great pleasure to share our recent work in a new direction to model protein degradation in cancer. Here is my disclosure slides. So um, we know that the great work from TCGA has found many mutations that are recurrent in cancers. And a lot of these currently have drugs which enable precision cancer medicine. For example, kinase pathways are frequently mutated and you can have kinase inhibitors. Genome integrity or cell cycle related mutations can be targeted by chemotherapy. Um, chromatin related factors um, with mutations can be targeted with epigenetic inhibitors. Immune signaling pathway can be targeted by immunotherapy. But there are two areas that you see a lot of frequent mutations. One is transcription factor. The other is the uh, protein ubiquitination or degradation pathway. They are frequently mutated, but there are currently not many drugs available to target them. And this is the area we started interested in. And first, uh, let me go through some background to introduce the uh, ubiquitin proteasome system, or UPS. So um, basically, a lot of the regular proteins in the cell are being degraded by the ubiquitin proteasome system. And many of these proteins have sequence patterns or diagrams, which can be recognized by E3 ligase. And E3 ligase will recognize this and bind to it. Then uh, it will, through E2, will add the ubiquitin onto the protein. And once the protein has a long chain of ubiquitin, they will be sent to the proteasome for degradation. And so most of our proteins are degraded this way. This is in, also in equilibrium because there are also deubiquitinating enzymes or dubs which remove the ubiquitin from the protein to keep the protein stable. In drug discovery world, they have, there have been drugs available. One is a protease, proteasome inhibitor. This basically block the proteasome, which pretty much blocks all proteins from being, many, many proteins from being degraded. The other is a DAB inhibitor, which basically remove or, or, or block the DAB function, which keeps the protein, um, which will make the protein degraded faster. But what really got us very interested is a new type of drug called ProTag. Basically, on the left side, this is the whole E3 proteasome uh, complex, uh, sorry, E3 complex. And this is the scaffold, and this is the E3 ligase, and this is the E2. And basically, if you have a small molecule drug, and one drug can bind to the E3, uh, one side can bind to the E3, the other side can bind to any target protein you want to degrade. And so this uh, small molecule will be an engager to bring the target protein to the E3, um, and then the E2 will add ubiquitin to degrade the, tar the target protein. This is really exciting uh, from a Nature News feature uh, last year. Basically, they described this as kind of the way to drug and druggable. Basically, if you want to target any protein, um, whether or not they have a good enzymatic pocket to degrade, all you need is to have a very specific small molecule to bind to it and the, on the other side that can bind to the uh, E3 ligase, you bring these two together, then uh, the target protein will be ubiquitinated and then sent to the proteasome for degradation. And what we thought is the most potential exciting drug development is to be able to degrade the transcription factors because so far it's been very difficult to uh, degrade or target transcription factors. And so um, for us, for any new direction we explore, one way is to learn more about it. The other is to use public data to see whether we can um, analyze public data to generate some insights. And so this is our general approach. The first, uh, first question we want to ask is whether there are genes in the UPS system that are frequently mutated. And for this, we take advantage of um, uh, the expertise from a postdoc Colin Tokai in the group who, whose work during PhD was to really look for recurrent mutations in cancer. So. Um, Basically, uh, during the PhD, 
Colin developed a computational method called 2020 plus uh, together with Bert Vogelstein at Johns Hopkins, basically looking at mutation patterns, conservation, other biochemical properties uh, that happens on the mutation and uh, develop a machine learning algorithm to predict whether a particular recurrent mutation is likely to be an oncogene or tumor suppressor gene or passenger gene. And so every gene is given a probability score. And based on this, we could look at the statistical sig significance of all the mutations and also now focused on the ubiquitinating enzyme and the dubs to see whether any of them are recurrently mutated with statistical significance. And so based on this, we found that actually 16% of all the cancer driver genes in the TCGA actually involves the UPS pathway genes. And so in here, the X and Y axis show the maximum oncogene score or the maximum tumor suppressor score of each uh, UPS gene in different cancer types. And you can see um, some of these genes can also be oncogene in some cancers, but tumor suppressor in other cancers. So overall, you can see UPS mutation is really quite prevalent. Because in this analysis, we only focus on the UPS pathway genes, we are able to um, reduce the uh, stringency of the FDR uh, multiple hypothesis testing so that the 2020 plus analysis is able to call 33 novel recurrent mutations, which previous studies were failed uh, to identify. And out of all the recurrently mutated UPS driver genes, we can see that the E3 genes are the most prevalent, followed by dubs, then E2 and E1. So that's the first part of analysis. Um, of course, we want to see what is the consequence of these UPS mutations. And so for that, we go to the next part, which is to look at the potential substrate of this UPS and see if the mutations in the UPS gene influence the downstream substrate um, protein level. And so for this, we uh, look again at TCGA data uh, um, as well. Um, because we are very interested in how transcription factors are degraded, we look at this case. For example, supposedly either a UB or a dub target a transcription factor. If, say, in the cancer, the, the UB or dub is mutated, we could compare the samples that have either mutant uh, or, or wild type and look at their differences. Supposedly, the transcription factor is expressed at um, a reasonable stable level, but because of the UB or, or dubs are mutated, their ability to degrade the transcription factor substrate is different. From TCGA, we may or may not have the protein pro data for this transcription factor. And on the RNA level, we actually won't be able to see that it's different because the UB and the dub works on the protein level. However, for transcription factors, their protein level or protein activity can be reflected by the downstream target genes that they regulate. And throughout the years, we have collected many transcription factor chip seq data, so we know their target gene. And um, so basically, uh, we published an algorithm previously called the RABBIT, uh, given the input as a list of differential genes and uh, log fold change of these genes, the output would be a predicted list of putative transcription factors. So in here, the input gene, we will compare in TCGA cancer, uh, each cancer type, um, the differential gene expression between the mutant versus wild type of the UPS system, and then uh, use rabbit to predict whether there are transcription factors that have differential activity based on the downstream target genes. And so using this approach, we were able to detect many um, UPS proteins whose mutation induce a transcriptional effect, which is uh, related to transcription factors. And so you can see here, we did multiple hypothesis testing, and these are the significant ones. And if we look at the top uh, predicted pairs of UPS and predicted substrate, many of these are previously characterized. For example, um, the FBOX7 
is known to degrade nick protein. A KEEP1 is known to degrade NFE2L2. SPOP is known to regulate or to degrade AR. And CYLD is known to, to uh, degrade RAL A, which is an F kappa B pathway. And BRCA1 is known to degrade estrogen receptor. And VHL is known to degrade orange protein. And so we're able to actually um, see many of these pairs. Um, so for example, let's look at one case. So we know KEEP1 is a E3 ligase. And when it is mutated, then FE2L2 is no longer degraded in the cancer. And in those cases, we can see the downstream target of NFE2L2 become much more activated. And this, uh, we can see this in TCGA data. It has also been reported. Interestingly, if we look at the scaffold protein COL3, it is also frequently mutated in cancer. And you would expect when COL3 is mutated, this KEEP1, which is usually attached to the COL3 in order to um, add ubiquitin to NFE2L2, should also stop to work. So without COL3, COL3 or, or with the COL3 mutation, indeed, we see that NFE2L2 targets also have differential expression. Interestingly, there seem to be another E3 in here, which influence uh, BRD4 and NIC through the downstream target genes. And so experimentally, we try to validate this. Um, and so first from CoIP, we can see that CO3 and NIC are, can, they can pull down each other, meaning that they bind to each other in a complex. In, in addition, when we use CRISPR to knock out CO3, indeed, we can see the NIC proteins become much more stable, which uh, indicates in this case, if you don't have the scaffold, the E3 will no longer be able to degrade NIC and we indeed see the protein to be more stable. So you can see here, using the transcription factors downstream targets, we're able to predict the transcription factor substrate of uh, UPS system uh, that are mutated in cancer. Um, so this is on the top part, which evaluates the mutations on the UPS system themselves. Next, we are going to try to look at mutations in the substrate, especially the diagram sequence that are recognized by the E3 ligase. First, we collected a database of known diagram sequences. And if we know where the real diagram appears on the protein, and then we just randomly take another sequence on the same protein as the negative set, we try to train a machine learning approach. And we take previously, uh, there is a paper where they can, be they can code the uh, peptide sequence by evolutionary conservation, flexibility, solvent exposure, hydrophobicity, charge, and, and many other features. So we can use the positive uh, annotated diagrams and all the random sequences to train a random forest model to see what features are, are important to distinguish a diagram from a fake sequence. And um, using this much, uh, random forest, you can see we can achieve a pretty good prediction accuracy. And the most important features are evolutionary conservation, um, flexibility, which means the protein is usually not in, uh, the diagram is not in alpha helix or beta strand, but in the loop region. Also, amino acid solvent exposure is important. So the, the diagram usually needs to face outside of the protein rather than being packaged inside of the protein, which can then be recognized by the E3. Um, this is one example. Cycling D1 is a very important gene for cell cycle regulation. And if we look at its overall mutation patterns, they are really enriched towards the end of the protein. Most of the time when you see mutations that happen um, as uh, uh, towards the, the end, it's like questionable what kind of effect they have. But you, you can see here, um, the mutation especially are enriched in this fossil background region. And if we look at TCGA, um, it turns out in the RPPA protein microarray data, there is a probe for cyclin D1. And so if we look at cyclin D1 when it's normal, uh, the protein level is like this. Whereas if there are mutations that happen towards the end of the, or the C terminals of the protein, you can see the, the orange case 
the protein level is, is higher. And the more extreme case is the mean sense mutation that happens right on the phosphodiagram region. You can see when the protein harbor this, um, the cyclin D1 protein level is much, much higher. And so um, we have looked at some simple cases of uh, mutations on the diagram, but the current knowledge of the annotated diagram are very, very limited. We only have knowledge about 200 diagrams uh, of known proteins. So we try to do a systematic de novo diagram discovery effort um, by using the deep diagram inference. And so for this, we take advantage of two recently published paper by Steve Elledge. They developed this global protein stability assay, which can allow for de novo diagram uh, discovery. Basically, they have a lentivirus expression vector system. So they share a common promoter and express a GFP protein. And this GFP can basically measures the total protein level. And then, um, the second part of this is a separate, so the transcription is together, but the protein uh, translation is separate. The GFP in here is uh, tagged to a peptide sequence. And in here, um, the allergies group basically can clone in the C-terminal or N-terminal 23 amino acid peptide for every protein in the human genome. And so they, they, they attach the peptide in here and the level of GFP is controlled by the peptide, which can be degraded depending on whether that peptide contains a strong or weak diagram sequence. And so basically in this assay, they, they clone in all the different uh, C-terminal or N-terminal peptides into the different vectors, transfect them into different cells, and then run this assay and sort by the GFP to RFP level. So these genes, are, and then they can separately sequence out the different vectors and the, the, the peptide DNA sequence. And so you can see basically if the RFP level is significantly higher than the GFP, this protein is unstable because the green protein, because of the peptide sequence, gets degraded uh, a lot. Whereas the uh, sequences on the top, these are more stable proteins. And so you can convert the original sequencing readout into uh, this type of data. And the red is more stable and the, the, the gray is, or is, is uh, less stable. And so using this approach, uh, the, the resulting data, we can develop machine learning algorithms. And so we build a deep learning model. The input of this is the 23 amino acid peptide of C-terminal and N-terminal peptides that uh, is cloned into the GPS vector. And the output is whether this protein is uh, stable or unstable. And so we only have two layers here to make sure that we don't overtrain this uh, machine learning model. Um, and so using this, we can make the predictions. In addition, we believe that what is important is the position-specific amino acid sequence. In comparison, if we just have a bag of amino acid based on what is you know, the amino acid that's present in the 23 uh, uh, amino acid peptide, um, that only kind of determine whether some amino acid is more likely to have a diagram or not. We can then subtract this to get the real diagram potential and see how well we are predicting the um, protein degradation. And so if you look at this uh, ROC curve, traditional approach are very simple rule-based approach and you can see that they don't actually do very well. Whereas um, in our approach, we can either use logistic regression or random forest. And in this case, deep diagram uh, using this uh, deep learning approach indeed seem to have the best performance. Um, from this, we are able to identify many novel diagrams. So previous diagrams are all consecutive amino acid peptides. But in our case, we can find novel pe uh, peptides diagrams that uh, can indicate that some sequence are important even with a middle based uh, amino acid that's not so important. And so we tested a number of the novel diagrams that were predicted, including the C-terminal and N-terminal diagrams. And you can see in each case, after we use the um, uh, mutations, uh, we create the mutations, indeed the, the protein is becoming 
more stable because without the dagron, E3 can no longer recognize them and the peptide will no longer be degraded. And this experimental validation was done by Steve Allergy's group because they have the assay system ready and we made the prediction. So they were really happy to help us validate this. So um, with the knowledge of both the known and the de novo dagrons that we discovered, we went back to reevaluate the uh, TCGA mutations to see whether any of the known or, or newly predicted dagrons are mutated in cancer. And, um, and so in this case, we are looking at mutations either in the uh, C-terminal or N-terminal protein and see whether any mutations compared to the well type really disrupt a dagron potential. And if we look at all the mutations to create this background, we can see if there are some outliers here, which indicate statistically, this is a very significant uh, change in the dagron potential. And so we ran this analysis on all the mutations. You can see here, the strongest two mutations happen on the GATA gene and also PPM1D gene. Um, GATA seem to be important in all the cancer types, especially in breast cancer, whereas PPM1D seem to be important in many cancer types. So if we look at GATA3, again, this is an interesting case. You can see the mutation happens towards the C-terminal side of the protein, um, it, especially towards the end where uh, the diagram sequence is uh, present. And so, uh, in TCGA, there are also RPPA data, protein array data for GATA3. And you can see, indeed, um, mutations happen uh, for GATA only in the luminal A and the luminal B subtypes, but are not present in the other subtypes. And in here, you can see here, when we have the GATA3 frame shift mutation, which will basically um, end the protein early on, so the background sequence will be eliminated. And you can see here the GATA3 protein indeed are more uh, stable. We further experimentally validated not only the frame shift mutation in this case, uh, this is the frame shift mutation at uh, uh, 400 amino acid location. And so the diagram sequence is completely eliminated. But we also tested two different mutations. One is this um, changing from this A to an M. The other is changing the G to an E. And so you can see in each of these cases, um, after we mutate this one amino acid sequence on the diagram, these are also mutations that you observe in the TCGA uh, mutations. Indeed, this protein now becomes more stable in a breast cancer cell line. And in the truncated form, you can see the protein is shorter and also more stable. Um, in the other cases, these are positive controls. If we add a, a flag tags towards the end, so the diagram sequence usually are at the end, but if you add another peptide sequence towards the end, the protein then is a lot more stable. We further tested the two cases where we changed the amino acid sequence because they are more stable. We wonder whether these transcription factors now can bind to different regions. So we did chip seek on the mutated GATA3. Compared to the well type, we can see they have a lot more binding sites and uh, there are also a significant overlap between the two. And if we look at the genes that are upregulated near those increased the GATA3 peaks, you can see in terms of pathways, they are really enriched in estrogen signaling pathway, which can explain um, GATA3 interaction with estrogen receptor in the luminal breast cancers. Um, another case is uh, we mentioned the PPM1D, and you can see again the mutation happens towards the end of the protein, um, especially uh, at the very, very end. There are also mutations early on that will create a frame shift mutation, so the remaining protein is no longer uh, uh, like uh, translated. And so we again created the mutation in here at 605 and 604 of the amino acid. You can see again, a single amino acid sequence change can make the protein more stable. We also try this frame shift mutation, which will truncate the protein at 450. And you can see the peptide is, uh, the protein is shorter, also much more stable. And again, here, we if we add an HA tag at the very, very end, which basically, um, add an additional protein, this will, will make the diagram kind of more 
uh, invisible to the to the E3, and indeed you can see in these cases the, the PPM1D protein is uh, uh, a lot more stable. So PPM1D is a negative regulator of P53. It especially regulates the phosphorylation of P53, which is important for P53 function. And so you can see here, depending on the different form of PPM1D, even though the total P53 level don't change so much, the phospho P53 really change a lot, which indicates that in tumors with the PPMD mutation, the protein become more potent, and then the phospho level of the P53 will, will no longer be available. And actually, the downstream DNA damage response of the cell will change, which is, has been reported to be important, like P53 uh, phosphorylation is important for some of the cancer cells to respond to chemotherapy. And so in addition to looking at the mutations um, in the uh, C-terminal and N-terminal protein, we also look at cases where there are fusion genes. So basically in fusion genes, you have one gene and another gene, which usually they are kind of separated on the chromosome or they are further apart, but for a translocation, a portion of gene A is now stitched to another portion of gene B and they create a fusion protein and the, some other parts of gene A and gene B gets eliminated. And so depending on where the diagram sequence are present and how the fusion happen, um, in fusion genes, diagrams can be either gained or lost. Um, and so if we look at all the fusion genes, we notice that 30% of the oncogene fusions actually involve a diagram loss. Sometimes this is on the uh, C-terminal and sometimes it's internal of the protein. And based on our prediction, these are still um, likely to be an active diagram. Uh, for example, in, in one case, there's a red fusion and the three term, the, the kind of a, um, the three prime end of this protein is present. So, but the five prime, which contain an N-terminal diagram is deleted. Uh, another case is the five, five prime, which is the N-terminal of the EGFR when it form a fusion, the C-terminal diagram is, is, um, is lost. And so you can see basically, in, in fusion cases, not only um, sometimes um, gene A can be a much higher expressed gene in a particular tissue, and then gene B normally is an oncogene, and through this fusion, gene B have a much higher gene expression. But in this case, um, if there is a diagram loss, not only this fusion gene can be expressed at ha much higher level, but also the protein can be a lot more stable. So let's look at one example. This is the Philadelphia chromosome that is in uh, very often in CML uh, leukemia or lymphoma. And so in this case, there is a BCR able uh, fusion. So BCR um, is gene A and it's the beginning of BCR stitched to the end of ABLE. And interestingly, at the end terminal, at the beginning of this protein, there is an SPOP diagram. And the fusion happens right after the SPOP diagram. And so we can see here, um, ABLE is a substrate of SPOP. And so in this cell, if you have the uh, SPOP uh, protein, ABL is or ABL is being degraded. This is the wild type ABL. But if we mute, if we knock out the SPOP, you can see the ABL protein is becoming much more stable. And so this is the uh, another way to draw this. Depending on the level of the SPOP, the ABL can be uh, degraded uh, much more. Interestingly, if we create the background mutation or the gene fusion which uh, is similar to uh, this BCR able, you can see here the level of the SPOP, SPOP is the E3 ligase is no longer playing a role. The ABL, because it lost the diagram, is always stable in the cell. And this is really driving the CML cancer progression. And um, so this is a summary of our approach and you know, basically public data a lot of times can give us a lot of interesting insights by looking at all of TCGA, we can see the mutations that are very prevalent in the UPS system. And we also evaluated their effect uh, of the downstream substrate if the downstream substrate is a transcription factor because we can see the effect through its uh, 
target genes. And then we evaluated mutations on the substrate that happens on the diagram sequence for E3 recognition. And not only we look at the known diagrams, we also use the GPS assay and the uh, deep learning approach to help us learn uh, novel diagrams and use it to reevaluate all the mutations that perturb the diagram sequence and evaluate their consequences. And so the summary of our finding is that the known information about UPS regulation in disease is limited due to the lack of systematic models. And using the unbiased genomic GPS approach and our machine learning approach, we can review mutated diagrams implicated in cancer. We found that over 19% of the cancer drivers, including uh, mutations on the UPS and also on the diagrams are related to the UPS system. And also previously truncated proteins are considered to be uh, loss of function because you thought that they, they would induce a uh, nonsense mediated decay. But what we can see that truncated mutations that really just perturb the diagram sequence turn out uh, can be gain of function mutations because the, the protein will be more stable. We also found altered protein stability is a very prevalent mechanism for oncogene gene fusions. And uh, through our analysis, we found that regulations of protein degradation is as complex as DNA and RNA regulation. And uh, we hope that this is just the uh, very early work in this and uh, the mutations that increase protein stability can be potential target for developing prototype drugs. And we're hoping this study will generate more interest in the field and we look forward to collaborating with um, Cancer, other cancer biologists who are interested in developing protect drugs. And so I want to thank members in my lab. The computational work is being spearheaded by a talented postdoc in the lab, Colin Tokai, and he is being supported by a fellowship from the Damon Ryan Cancer Research Foundation. Um, Xiaoqing Wang is an experimental postdoc jointly supervised by us and the Miles Brown Lab, and he helped with many of the experimental validation. Richard Timms helped with testing the novel diagrams we predicted, and uh, Jing Liu from Wen Yi Wei's lab helped us to validate the BCR ABLE uh, gene fusion. And I want to thank other members of the lab and our funding agency, and I will stop here for questions. Thank you.